Welcome back to my channel. I'm Derek Clamartin from CodeOpinion.com, and here are five things you can do to make your API more evolvable. Over time, your API is going to change. It will evolve, and you don't want to handcuff yourself. So here are things you can implement today to make it easier to change. Thanks to Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So the first tip is where you're generating identifiers, IDs. It's typical if you're using a database and you have some auto-incrementing ID is that your database is actually the one generating it. So we have a client, make a request. Let's say we're placing an order. We persist that data to our database and our database at that point is the one generating that ID, let's say that order ID. And then we use that and return it possibly all the way back or use it somewhere else. So what's the issue with auto-incrementing IDs? Maybe nothing, depends on your environment, your context. But if you're in a distributed environment with multiple different database servers, you could be generating the exact same unique identifier, that same ID. That could pose a problem if you ever want to merge data. However, this is also an issue if you want to move work asynchronously. That means generating that identifier farther up the call stack. It could even happen at the client if it's trusted, but as well as it could happen at the API level, at that point we're generating that, I, that order ID. It could be a UUID, a GUID, that's what we're actually persisting to our database. But this also helps when we're moving work asynchronously. If we were returning that order ID back to our client, if we were generating it with that auto incrementing ID at our database, that means it has to happen. The full execution needs to happen. If we're generating it at our API level, then we can actually return that ID and move that work asynchronously. That means when we generate that order ID from our API, we can then actually just place a message on our queue and then separately return that order ID and have our workers, some separate process, handle that message completely asynchronously, and then it can persist it to the database. We haven't really necessarily changed functionality. We're still, our API still works exactly the same as it did to our client, but we're moving that work asynchronous. If you're working in a distributed environment or you need to scale and you wanna move work asynchronously, where you're generating these IDs matters. You need to push it farther up the call stack. But that's not the only tip for identifiers. Here's another one. So the second tip is generating something meaningful as an identifier. Now, some people refer to this as kind of human readable. I'm really more referring to human understandable. I don't mean human readable by kind of these silly identifiers that get randomly generated like smelly cat or whatever the case may be. That doesn't mean anything. I'm talking something that actually has meaning. So to refer to that, when we are creating that order, Instead of creating some GUID UUID that is just completely random, or I guess should say doesn't mean anything to you, it's at that point generating an order ID that's meaningful. That when you're looking at you as an end user, somebody working in the system can understand and that is valuable information to have at a glance. So for example, I live in Ontario, Canada. So C-A-O-N is the province, maybe some other number that could be date related, but generating some um, ID that's going to be unique, but has information, has a meaning to it. Yes, that may be composed of other information, but it's always really useful when you're looking at this to know maybe geographically. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of slice this data and still keep it unique and it will be meaningful. With these first two tips, they aren't blanket statements saying you should do this everywhere. Of course not. If you've been watching my channel, you understand that I'm really about context, where something serves and has value. So these are just suggestions about if you're going to be distributed, if you're going to have moving work asynchronously and you need to scale in certain areas or and in certain parts of your systems, you can generate meaningful IDs that will help people at a glance looking at information. Apply it where appropriate. Tip number three relates to responses and understanding and providing the client information about what they can do. If we look at this data related to, let's say it's an order. Okay, I have order data. I have a, like the when it was placed, the total, the status, who the customer is, great. But what can I actually do with this order? It's pending. Well, sure, as a developer, at kind of design time when I'm building out my UI or whatever I'm doing with this API, is well, okay, I'm looking at the documentation, I'm trying to figure out, okay, here's all the different actions I can perform. I can cancel an order, for example. But well, when can I cancel an order? Well, when it's maybe, let's say, only when it's pending. If it's being shipped, well, or has been shipped, you can't cancel the order. So at design time, when I'm actually writing this code as the client and client code a UI, 
It's now I'm adding this logic based on the documentation, but again, things evolve, things change. So how do we provide our API with information about what it can do? In a lot of systems, the actions that you can perform are based on the state of the system or your users' permissions, but a lot of it's based on what does the state of a system look like right now. So because of that, you know what the state of the system is in your response. So can this order be canceled? Provide that, a part of your response. We have a list of actions here. One of them is cancel order. So we can provide the client back saying, listen, here's the actions you can perform based on the state of this order. You can cancel it. What this means is our client, our end client, our UI is looking for this particular key, this name saying cancel order. That's what it cares about. If that exists, then it knows it can cancel an order. If this doesn't exist, it know that it's not in a state and it maybe not provide some particular UI elements to even let you cancel an order. So that means that we're providing back to the client via our API what it can and cannot do based off the state of the system. That means that you won't have as much business logic or duplicated logic on the client, which you already have on the server anyways. And I mentioned evolvability, and that's really important here because things change. When we look at this response again, Let's say we make some business change related to, okay, well, before it was just if the status was pending, but now it's if the status is pending and the order was placed within 15 minutes, then you can cancel an order. If we had this logic on the client, we'd be changing it on the server and the client, but now we can just make this change on the server and not provide this action of cancel order if we've gone past that 15 minute threshold. Another really important aspect of this is that you no longer care about identifiers or URIs because you're not constructing them. They're given to you at runtime. So what I mean by that is because we're looking at for an action, let's say cancel order, this is the key, we're not constructing what the URI is. The server gave it to us. It's completely opaque. The URI is completely opaque to the client at this point. It could have included the identifier in the actual route. So uh, like to tail this into the first stuff is that the IDs almost become irrelevant to you now in terms of generating them as well as constructing URIs. You're not really thinking about it. Evolvability, now routes can change. This is what has to stay consistent about what this key is, but the actual routes in the past for any of your APIs can actually change. No more bike shedding about URI structure. If you have state and it's meaningful to the actions that can be performed, provide it back to the client. The fourth tip is don't handcuff yourself in your response. Allow room to actually make changes that are gonna be backwards compatible. So as the example here, I have a list of orders. This is what our API returns, that's it. But what happens if I wanna add something to the root of this? Well, that's kind of a problem. I'm gonna to have to completely change the structure. If you're going back to tip number three related to hypermedia and providing actions and other information, you may wanna do so. If this particular API had searching functionality, let's say by status, well, what are the statuses? With this current structure, I can't return anything else other than a list of orders. Rather, what we might wanna do is return instead of an array, just an object that contains the statuses, everything that you could actually search by, and then the list of the orders. Just be thinking about in your response, and this doesn't necessarily just be the root, it's any type of element that you're returning, is that really gonna be what it is? As the example with status, do you really wanna be returning a string here? Maybe there's something that's not a string that's not gonna be the client might be using to kind of stringify things. Maybe this is actually an object with some type of identifier that identifies what pending is. That's gonna be very static rather than a string. So just think about the structure of the data that you're returning and don't handcuff yourself. Tip number five is using the language of your domain that people actually understand and not technical nonsense like factories, adapters, all these weird things or things that you may come up with your own terms when somebody in the domain would not even refer to it that way. Use the language of the domain. Some things are gonna be crud, I get it. But in this case of an order, it's not update order. No, it's cancel order. That's what you're doing, you're canceling an order. It's not updating an order. So capturing the behaviors of the domain, using the terminology there is really critical and being consistent with it. Again, you're creating an API, yes, for other developers, so the R tech people, but get away from the technical nonsense and focus on what are the actual capabilities What's the data related to this that you're actually returning that is makes sense within the domain? Now that may seem obvious and it is more common that people are naming entities, nouns, as things in the domain, that makes sense. But what's less common is actually capturing explicitly 
the names of the behaviors or the capabilities that your system actually provides that are often a part of workflow. And those should be exposed in your API and named appropriately. I really do think these five tips will help you evolve your system without having to make breaking changes. I mentioned earlier that a lot of this isn't just kind of blanket statements where you need to be doing this everywhere. Pick selectively where these make sense and where they'll help you in the future. If you want to join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other developers about topics like this, you can join my channel. The link's in the description. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions or other tips that you'd like to share, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.